Hi everybody and welcome to unit eight, part three. We're gonna continue our discussion of solutions today. Um, and we are gonna talk about several different things. So the first is just kind of forming a solution. We've already talked about whether or not a solution will form, all right? So whether a solution will form is based on what type of substances are involved. So this is, we're talking here about, are we talking a polar substance um, or nonpolar? All right, so this just brings back that like dissolves like situation that we've talked about before. All right, the next question to ask once you know you can get a solution to happen is how fast we can get this solution. And we've all had experience with this dealing with some sort of powdered drink, whether it's like lemonade or Gatorade. And there's different things that we do in order to get that solute to dissolve into the solvent, all right? And most of that has to do with speeding particles up and exposing those solute particles to the solvent particles, all right? So the first thing we think of what, what we do when we make a powder drink is we stir it, all right? By stirring, we are increasing the motion, okay? Which is helpful in getting a solute to dissolve. We are exposing, all right, more solute particles, okay, to the solvent. All right, and we are in fact increasing the surface area, all right, when we stir. So surface area gets its own. Um, with surface area, again, you want more solute touching more solvent. And the best kind of explanation for this one is if you think of, if you've ever seen sugar cubes, um, you know, little cubes of sugar that sometimes they'll have for people's tea at restaurants, um, that's going to take longer to dissolve than just a teaspoon of sugar from a spoon. And they're the exact same amount, all right? So again, we are, I'm just gonna kind of put a little arrow here, we're exposing more solute to solvent when we increase that surface area. Finally, temperature, all right? So the warmer something is, the more likely a um, solid is going to dissolve. So temperature is a measure of what we call kinetic energy, all right? And that's the energy of motion, all right? So if we increase the temperature, we are increasing the motion, all right? And therefore we will get a faster uh, forming solution. All right, so just some things to think about. Our next topic that we're gonna discuss is what is called solubility. All right, solubility is the amount of solute that dissolves in a given amount of solvent at a specific temperature. All right, this graph, which doesn't look great right here, but it should be pretty clear in your notes, is what's called a solubility curve. And this particular solubility curve has several different substances. All right, and here I have sucrose, I have potassium nitrate, ammonium sulfate, um, sodium chloride. All of these lines represent those different uh, solid solutes. Now, solubility in water, so our solvent is water, and solubility for this particular graph, you always have to look at the graph, it could be different, is in grams of solute per 100 grams of water. That's what grams over 100 grams means. On the x-axis, you have temperature. As you can see, certainly for sucrose and potassium nitrate, and even in a, to a smaller degree for our last two, as we increase the temperature, we can get more solute to dissolve in water. All right, all along these lines, we have what is called a saturated solution. So saturated, you wanna write this down, solution. All right, and that is the maximum amount of solute that will dissolve in that amount of sol um, solvent, all right? This is actually when what the line represents. Okay. If you are below the line at all, we say that you are unsaturated. Okay, And an unsaturated solution means that I could add more solute. So more solute can be added. All right, so on the line you are saturated, 
Below the line, you are unsaturated. All right, we're gonna do some work on this um, in class and see how you interpret that graph. So be ready to do that. Okay. All right, so some factors affecting solubility that we can see on the graphs, and you'll see in different types of graphs, is temperature, all right? Temperature for solids and liquids, as the temperature increases, the solubility increases. For gases, it is the opposite, so it is important to remember that, all right? And the best way to remember that is think of the sodas that we drink, all right? When we get a soda at a store, um, you know, a fountain soda, we they are gonna keep that soda, that water, um, at cool temperatures, so all of that carbon dioxide will stay in there. It's the carbon dioxide that gives us the bubbles and gives us that sensation that we want when we're drinking soda, all right? So for solids and liquids, you want a high temperature. For gases, you want a low temperature for the highest solubility. As far as pressure, um, the pressure of the system has very little effect if your solute is a liquid or a solid. But if it is a gas, it becomes very important. Uh, next, or, yeah, next semester, we're gonna talk a lot about gases and you're gonna see that pressure is very, very important. All right, uh, there is a gas law that is called Henry's Law. And it says at a given temperature, the solubility of a gas in a liquid is directly proportional to the pressure of the gas above the liquid. Well, what does that mean? If you increase the pressure, you will increase the solubility for a gas. Again, best example is sodas. We know if we have a can of soda and we open that up, it releases that pressure. That's because that soda was made under high pressure to keep all of that carbon dioxide in. All right, fantastic. Okay, our final topic for this unit is what is known as colligative properties. All right, colligative properties okay, is when a solvent's properties change due to the addition of a solute. So water is the solvent that we talk about, all right, and water has certain properties. We know water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, it freezes at zero degrees Celsius. If you put a solute into that water, whether it is sugar, whether it is sodium chloride, or any of the other compounds we've talked about, those that um, boiling point and freezing point will actually change, and we, and we call that a colligative property when it changes. All right, we are gonna be looking at three colligative properties. One is vapor pressure, freezing point, and boiling point. All right, for these colligative properties, we will only be discussing what are known as non-volatile solutes, and all non-volatile means is that those solutes are gonna stay in the water, all right? They're not gonna evaporate. So the, the solutes themselves will not complicate, if you will, the situation. All right, before we can look at these colligative properties, we need to go back and talk about concentrations of solutions a little bit. We've spent a lot of time on molarity, which remember is moles of solute over liters of solution. Okay, um, next up is what is called molality, and we're gonna be using that today. All right, I've told you that chemists love the letter M and they really do. Molality gets the lowercase m, and molality stands for moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. All right, so in this case, we know the exact amount of solvent, unlike in molarity where we do not. All right, so molality is gonna be one that we're certainly gonna be using today with colligative properties. And then finally, our last one is mole fraction. Mole fraction is just like a percent, but we don't multiply it out. And it could be of your solute or your solvent. All right, um, we are going to focus on, all right, moles of solvent. So we wanna know what percentage of a solution is the solvent, all right, over your total moles of solution. Now we're focusing on moles of solvent. Please realize for a mole fraction, it could be solute, but we're not gonna be dealing with any problems that deal with that. And total moles mean your moles of solute plus moles of solvent. 
And when I put an E on mole, it, it's just writing it out. There's no difference between the two. All right, so again, mole fractions, just like a percentage, except for we don't multiply it out. And mole fractions sometimes gets the abbreviation X. We're not gonna worry about that. All right, so let's go on ahead and talk a little bit about vapor pressure, because that's our first colligative property. All right, so here we go. I am going to draw, to the best of my ability here, two beakers, okay? And in my first beaker, I just have pure water, okay? Um, so on the surface of my water, just imagine again a water or a beaker full of water, I have only water molecules. Well, even when water is a liquid, some of it is going to turn into a gas. It just naturally happens. And when that happens, all right, it causes a certain amount of pressure. So for my pure water here, some of these molecules are going to turn into a gas, causing a pressure. Great, all right, that's just the way that's gonna happen. And water would have its vapor pressure. Okay. Now I am going to have a solution. So now, instead of just my pure water and my little empty circles are my water, I'm now going to have some solute in there. And my colored in circles are your solute. All right, again, so I have my surface. The vast majority of my molecules are gonna still be water, but now I'm gonna have a couple solute particles, all right? And those solute particles are not going to evaporate. So in a way, they're actually kind of blocking how much water can evaporate. So now you're only gonna get some of the water to turn into gas causing a vapor pressure. So what's gonna happen? All right, the vapor pressure of your solution is gonna be lower than that of the vapor pressure of your pure solvent. All right. So this leads us to what's known as Routes Law. The vapor pressure of a solution varies directly as the mole fraction of the solvent. All right, well, that's just a fancy way of saying, all right, that the vapor pressure, okay, is going to decrease with the addition of a solute. All right, so let's see how we're going to deal with that mathematically. So your vapor pressure of your solution is going to be equal to the mole fraction of your solvent. So what percent of the surface is that solvent? That's basically what that's saying. Times the vapor pressure of the solvent. And in our case, that's gonna be water. So let's say that 0.9, all right, is your mole fraction. You're just gonna take 0.9 and multiply it by the vapor pressure of the water, which is a number I'm always gonna give you. So let's take a look at an example. Okay. All right. Find the vapor pressure of a water solution in which the mole fraction of HgCl2, a non-volatile, non-ionizing solute, is 0.163. The vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees is 3.2 kilopascals. I will always give you the vapor pressure of water at the temperature. That's always going to be a given. But be careful. I told you that the mole fraction of HgCl2, this is your solute. All right, what we need is the mole fraction of the solvent. So what am I gonna do? Well, the solution's only made of two things. All right, and again, this is like a percentage. So I'm gonna take one, I'm gonna subtract 0.163 from that because that's your solute. So here's my total. I'm taking out the solute, and what I'm gonna be left with is the mole fraction of the solvent, which is what I need. And that's 0.837. <clears throat> so I'm going to take that 0.837, I'm going to multiply it, <clears throat> excuse me, by 3.2 kilopascals, which again was the given vapor pressure, all right, and then you're going to find that your new vapor pressure of this solution is 2.7 kilopascals, all right, now ask yourself, did the vapor pressure do what was expected? We expected it to go down. The pure solvent was 3.2, your solution's 2.7. Totally makes sense. All right, let's take a look at number two. 
Number two, you have 250 grams of glucose in 450 mils of water at 25 degrees Celsius. What is the vapor pressure of the solution? All right, so notice, please, we're still at 25. So my vapor pressure is still 3.2. Again, I will always give that to you in some form, all right? So the first thing we need to do is we need to solve, solve, all right, for mole fraction, okay? Well, that means I need to turn some things into moles. Well, I have 250 grams of glucose, which we all know, C6H12O6, Great, I can change that into moles without a problem. One mole of that molar mass is 180 grams. I do that and I get 1.39 grams of my glucose. All right, now remember I need the moles of water. Now I gave you the water in milliliters. It's important to remember for water and water alone, one gram of water is equivalent to one milliliter. The density of water is one gram per milliliter. So if I have 450 milliliters of water, that means I have 450 grams of water. We can only do that, only for water, all right? And as we know, one mole of water is 18 grams. And so that gives me 25, um, I'm sorry, up here should have written moles, not grams there, so 1.39 moles, and this is 25 moles of water. All right, time to go on ahead and do our mole fraction. So remember, we want the mole fraction of the solvent, so it's going to be 25 divided by my total here, which is 25 plus 1.39. All right, fantastic. And when I do that, I get a mole fraction of 0.947, or another way of saying that is 94.7% of this um, of this solution, all right, of the surface of this solution is just water. And I'm just double checking my math. All right, and absolutely, I'm good to go. So this is your mole fraction. All right, what am I gonna do with this? I'm gonna multiply it by my vapor pressure, which is 3.2 kPa. And when I do that, I get 3.03 kilopascals, which is a pressure measurement. All right, and that is my final answer, okay? All right, great, so let's move on to our next colligative property, and that one is freezing point, okay? Uh, what's nice is solving for freezing point and boiling point is very, very similar. So the process um, is, again, very similar and should be pretty straightforward. All right, in order for a substance to freeze, it must make an orderly pattern. The presence of a solute disrupts this um, process. Therefore, more kinetic energy must be taken away to get the substance to freeze. The freezing point of a solution is lower than the freezing point of the pure solvent. If you've ever made ice cream by hand, you know that in that ice you actually use rock salt, you add salt to that. And the reason being is what that does is that makes a salt water solution when some of that ice melts, and that's actually gonna be at a lower temperature than just pure ice that has melted. So it keeps your ice cream at the temperature needed to actually, or keeps your cream, if you will, at the temperature needed to make ice cream. All right, now, um, calculating freezing point, there is an equation. Delta, remember a delta means change in, temp F, and I'm gonna write everything under this too, is equal to KF times lowercase m times I. All right, so delta TF is the change in temp, okay? and that's of the freezing point. That's what the F stands for. KF is your freezing point constant. This is one I'm gonna give you, or you'll have in your notes. And that is 1.85 degrees Celsius per molol, is how we say that. That one's a tough one to say. All right, and I'm gonna rewrite that at the top so you can see it. KF is equal to 1.85 degrees Celsius per molality, lowercase m. 
Our lowercase m here is obviously then molality. And this i is your number of particles. It's actually called the von Hoft factor, which is fun to say, but we'll just call it the number of particles. So what do I mean by that number of particles? All right, with these problems, freezing point and boiling point, you have to determine whether you're dealing with an ionic or a covalent compound because ionic compounds break into their parts. So let's see what I mean by that. If you had sodium chloride and you put that into water, well, you're actually getting, for every one sodium chloride, you're getting two particles in solution. So this would have an I equal to two, all right? Because you're getting two particles, okay? If, let's say, I had calcium chloride, well, you're getting a calcium and two chlorides. So you're gonna have an I that's equal to three, all right? Both of those are ionic. If you're dealing with a covalent compound, something let's say like glucose, C6H12O6, and how do I know it's covalent? Those are all nonmetals. All right, so that's covalent. Covalent compounds do not break up into their individual atoms. They stay as an entire molecule. So all covalent compounds will have an I of just one. All right, so all covalent compounds will have an I of one. So you must identify whether you are dealing with um, ionic or covalent in these situations. All right, so let's take a look at our example. What is the freezing point of a solution that contains five grams of potassium chloride in 150 grams of water? All right, well, again, our equation, delta TF is equal to KF times molality times I, all right? Well, we always have KF, so that's not a problem, that's a constant. So 1.85 degrees Celsius per molo. Molality, all right? Well, molality I have to solve for, so let's take a look. Remember, little m is moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. All right, so I'm gonna go up here. Well, I don't have my moles of solute, but I certainly have my grams. So I have 5.0 grams of KCl. I like to do this all in one problem. In 150 grams of water, well, that's 0.15 kilograms of water. I'm now gonna change from my grams to moles. In one mole of KCl, I have 74.6 grams. Got that from the periodic table, which gives me 0.447 little m. Okay, so that goes right up here in this problem, 0.447 mol, and that's how you say it, it is strange. And then finally, I need my I, my number of particles. Well, potassium chloride, that is ionic, potassium is a metal, and it has two ions in it, so its I is two. All right, and when you multiply all of those together, you get 1.65 degrees Celsius, all right? Now, be careful, that's not actually your answer, all right? This is what you just saw for is the change in the freezing point. Well, we know water's freezing point, pure water, is zero degrees. We know that the freezing point is going to get lower or depress, we say it's a depression. So I'm gonna go zero, and you don't have to write this out, minus 1.65. All right, and that's gonna give me my final answer of negative 1.65 degrees Celsius. Okay, that is your final answer. All right, now let's look at boiling point, okay? So think back to vapor pressure when you're thinking of boiling point, and remember when you have a solute, you have those solute particles that will not boil. They're gonna stay, so they're gonna stay the way they are. They're gonna stay solids. Um, and those solute particles actually block the water from boiling, from turning into a gas. So in order to get the solution to a point in which the vapor pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure, that's what boiling is, by the way, all right, you need to add more kinetic energy. So therefore, the boiling point of a solution is higher, all right, than the pure solvent. So the equation for calculating boiling point elevation, now we're gonna be going up, is very similar. It's 
delta T B for boiling point is equal to KB times molality times I. Now your KB, and I will give, or this is in your notes for you to use, this is not worth memorizing, 0.515 degrees Celsius per molal. Then the M is still molality and the I is still your number of particles. Why don't you go on ahead and pause this video and then you and try this example on your own. Okay. All right, so change in temp of your boiling point is equal to KB, so 0.515 degrees Celsius per molal. All right, times your molality. So here we go. So I have 25 grams of CaCl2 over, all right, remember with water, milliliters and grams are interchangeable, water only. So that means I have 450 grams of water, which is 0.45 kilograms of water. I'm gonna change my grams of calcium chloride into moles. One mole of calcium chloride of CaCl2 is 111.1 grams. That gives me 0 0.50 as my molality. Okay, so here we go, 0 0.50 mole. And then I look at calcium chloride to figure out my I. This is an ionic compound. All right, calcium is a metal. How many particles do I have? I have one calcium and I have two chlorides, so that's gonna be three. All right, you're going to multiply these together and you get 0.77 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now remember, that's not your final answer. Your boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. You're gonna add 0.77 to that because we know it is an elevation. So your final answer is 100.77 degrees Celsius. Your boiling point went up. All right, great. Okay, so our last part of this notes is our challenge problem. All right, and this is where you can use okay, um, colligative properties to solve for molar or molecular mass. It means the same thing. So determining molecular mass, remember that's interchangeable with molar mass. Let's take a look at the problem. If 99 grams of non-ionizing solute are dissolved in 669 grams of water and the freezing point of the resulting solution is 0.96, what is the molecular mass of the solute? All right, so this is gonna be a couple different steps. The first thing is you're gonna use the information from this problem to solve for the molality. Okay, so let's take a look at how we're gonna do that. Well, my change in temp, I actually already know that because my resulting solution had a freezing point of negative 0.96, which means the change, and we know that freezing point goes down and it went down from zero. So my change in temp was just simply 0.96. <clears throat> Molality is what we're solving for, so that's just gonna stay M. My freezing point constant, all right, is 1.85, that's a constant, that's not gonna change as long as we're dealing with water. And then your I, I told you this is non-ionizing. If it is non-ionizing, it means your I is equal to one. All right, so times one. Okay, great. So now I'm gonna go on ahead and I solve for my molality. And when I do that, I find that my molality is 0.519, okay? Now it's important to remember what that actually stands for, and I'm gonna now write this down here. I have 0.519 moles of solute over one kilogram of water, all right? Okay, so now let's remember what we're being asked. Why are we doing all of this? I need to know information just about my solute. So I really wanna get rid of this water. Do I have information about how much water I have? Well, yeah, up here, 99 grams of non-ionizing solute are dissolved in 669 grams of water. All right, well, I'm gonna use that to get rid of this water. So I'm actually gonna multiply this by 0.669 kilograms of water, because that's actually the amount that I have here. And if you notice, when I do this, my kilograms of water will go away, and I'll just be left with moles of solute. 
All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and do the math for this. And this gives me 0.347 moles of my solute. Okay, all right, again, this was right there. That's how much water I have. Multiply these two numbers, I got my moles of solute. Well, remember, what am I being asked for? I'm being asked for molar mass. Molar mass is in terms of grams per mole. All right, well, great. I have the mole part for my solute. And if I look back into my problem, I have how many grams? I have 99 grams of solute. So I'm going to take that 99 grams of solute. Remember, we don't know what the solute is. We're trying to figure that out. I'm gonna divide it by my 0.347 moles of solute. Okay, and that's gonna leave me with 285.3 grams per mole, and that is my final answer. This is how we can use a colligative property to figure out the molar mass of an unknown solute. So let's say you have something, you know it's a solution, but you don't know what's in it, this can help identify. All right, we're gonna do a lot of practice with this. Um, hope you have enjoyed solutions. They are a lot of fun to deal with and super important. So have a great one.